Hi, John Granham here again uh, with the latest in our series of videos about Irish ancestors and researching Irish ancestors and using the Irish ancestors site to do that. So today I'm going to be talking about the, the Registry of Deeds um, and I'm going to use the site as the section of the site dealing with the Registry of Deeds as a sort of speaking aid to do it. So let's go straight to the site now. Okay, here we are. Um, in the browse section, the free browse section, under the records menu, you have the registry of deeds. And this is, again, this is basically an expanded version of the chapter on the registry of deeds in my book, Tracing Your Irish Ancestors. There are a couple of points I always make to people at the very outset of any discussion of the Irish registry of deeds. Um, and they're, they're particularly to do with North Americans hearing the phrase, the, the Registry of Deeds. There are things called registries of deeds in many um, United States states, uh, states um, capitals and um, local county offices, and they are very similar to the Irish Registry of Deeds, but there are some very significant differences. First of all, um, my presumption is that the US um, registries of deeds handle all property transactions. In other words, they're a legal mechanism for um, finalising a property transaction. That it, The lawyers among you may, may quibble with me on that, but that, that's my understanding. The Irish Registry of Deeds is something entirely different. It was never obligatory to register a deed. Okay, uh, So why would anybody do it? Well, we'll come to that in a few minutes, but it was never obligatory, so it's not a complete list of um, registered legal con transfers of property, contracts for um, mortgages and so on and so forth. It's, it is not complete. It was not obligatory to register it. So it's, it's quite a different beast from the, the US um, Registry of Deeds. The second point I like to make is very much connected with that, that it's, it's a very specific minority of Irish people who used the Registry of Deeds. Okay, it is the landed, the propertied Anglo-Irish. And by Anglo-Irish, I mean members of the Church of Ireland, which is the basic, the, the, the defining characteristic of the Anglo-Irish. And it's particularly useful for the Anglo-Irish over about a century between 1720 and 1820, 1830. So that's, that's the sort of target we're talking about. Um, Obviously, that excludes the, the majority of the population who were Catholic tenant farmers. It also excludes the, um, the Presbyterians, um, most numerous in the northeast and Anstrom down um, in Ulster. So it, it is members of the Church of Ireland, that's Anglicans, Episcopalians, um, with some property, involved in property. Um, so th they're the people you're talking about. So again... It's quite, you need, because the records can be very cumbersome and can it be quite difficult to interpret, before you commit yourself to grinding through them, you need to be clear that um, your, your target is within that range. Okay. That much said, the records are wonderful. Okay. Um, it, this is the, the biggest, complete, unbroken set of records that survive in Ireland. Um, the Registry of Deeds was set up in 1708. Um, it was set up as part of the aftermath of the enormous transfer of ownership that happened in the 17th century and particularly at the end of the 17th century as the old Gaelic aristocratic order was finally defeated and the property was confiscated and redistributed. So the Registry of Deeds was a legal mechanism to assist in those um, transfers of property, the, the forced confiscation. Um, they, they, at the beginning of the, 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 the 17th century, um, around 1600, something like 60% of the, the, the land of Ireland belonged to the, the Catholic aristoc aristocracy, Catholic gentry. Um, by the end of the century, it was closer to 5%. So there was a huge transfer. Um, the people who got it were understandably a bit twitchy about their right to own it. So they needed mechanisms to, to help them sleep well at night. And the Register of Deeds was one of the ways that they, they managed to sleep well at night. Um, what it did was uh, add a, a legal defence to uh, a, a contract 
So if you made a lease with somebody and registered it with the Registry of Deeds, if there was a dispute, the fact that it was in the Registry of Deeds would give it precedent over any documents that weren't registered in the Registry of Deeds. So you sort of bought yourself a little bit um, extra legal status by registering in the Registry of Deeds. Um, the, 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 the corollary of that is that most deeds registered there, um, initially at least, were ones that people had reason to be defensive about. Um, and it's particularly true, for, for example, of the wills that are registered in the Registry of Deeds. Um, they tend to be expecting somebody to challenge them, so they register them uh, to give themselves that little bit of a, a head start in the courts. That much said, um, it became a habit amongst the Anglo-Irish to register the deeds, and it, be, it, it seemed to run in families. So you, once you hit a vein of a particular family registering marriage agreements or leases or mortgages, um, you're likely to be able to, to pull further threads and unravel more and more and more about the family. Okay. Um, there are some wonderful things um, about the Anglo-Irish, some wonderful historical aspects of the Anglo-Irish available in, in here as well. And because they're now all available online, um, they, they, I don't think these have been exploited by historical or literary researchers into the Anglo-Irish the way they should be. This, for example, is uh, an image of a memorial of a deed, a registered deed, between, um, as you can see, it's Johnston to Swift. This is between Esther Johnston and Dean Jonathan Swift, the man who wrote Gulliver's Travels, the man who basically founded the Anglo-Irish as a distinct people. Um, and Esther Johnson was his lifelong companion, um, well known. And this is um, Esther Johnson conveying um, Talbot's Castle in Trim to Jonathan Swift. I don't think the people who run Talbot's Castle in, in Trim are actually aware that, that Swift was um, leasing it from Esther Johnson. And uh, um, if they're looking at this, they're welcome to use it. OK, it, it seems to me uh, a very interesting thing. OK. It, it the, let me give you a sense of what the the registration was after after two parties legal parties and there could be four or five individuals in each party after they had signed a deed between each other and had it witnessed um, there'd be two copies held one by each of the parties one of those would then have a memorial made of the deed and a memorial was not an exact transcript. The, the, the act setting up the Registry of Deeds was um, gave all sorts of legal loopholes. It, it only had to convey the most important parts of the, the deed. So there was all sorts of scope for hiding what was, what was um, really intended in that. And that's one of the problems in dealing with the, the, the Registry of Deeds. It can be very easy for people to obscure what they're actually intended to do and it can be very difficult to disentangle what they're actually doing. So um, a memorial is not actually a facsimile copy of the original. Um, it was a summary more or less. Okay so once the, the summary was uh, was made um, it, an indenture was created. An indenture was a double copy of that memorial um, with a little indentation where it was cut in two, so the same. The, so you could bring the two together and make sure that they were. This was a very old way of ensuring that copies, two two pieces of paper, were part of the same original. Okay, one of those, it was sworn be, before a justice of the peace, and then sent to the Registry of Deeds, and in the Registry of Deeds it was transcribed into these giant memorial volumes, and. Um, those are the volumes that, that are now open for research. Um, the original memorials are actually preserved and they're still in the Registry of Deeds in the, in the vaults and they has, have all sorts of really interesting um, signatures. Again, Anglo-Irish Jonathan Swift, um, you have Wolf Tone, you have Napper Tandy, you have um, Henry Grattan, all sorts of people associated with, with the Anglo-Irish in the 18th century and the early 19th century. Um, <coughs> How do you get access to the information in them? Obviously, there's all sorts of useful family information there. Um, they're, they're very often leases were for lives named, so for the lives of John Smith and his two sons, Michael and Peter, 
um, often just for the life of the monarch, unfortunately. But the lives in leases can be very, very useful as well um, because they name and specify relationships. Marriage articles where two people married. Um, I'll say a little bit more about those in a second. Um, so getting into them, getting access to them, there are two main routes of access. There are two sets of indexes. Um, one by grantor, okay, so the, the, the deed we were just looking at was Esther Johnston to Swift. So that would be indexed under Johnston, not under Swift, okay? Um, and that's one of the problems. There is no grantees index. All right. There are plenty of entry, entries, by the way, in the Grantors Index for Dean Jonathan Swift. Um, he, he was um, a, a, an assiduous user of the, the registry himself. Anyway, uh, that's an aside. As well as the Grantors Index, um, which it can, given it started in 1708 and it's still in operation, um, it's those indexes are subdivided into different periods. And the format can vary from period to period, so you need to be aware of that. But the grantor's indexes are there, and it's, they're fully alphabetical. Okay, the, then there's a lands index, and that is based on the premise that the vast majority of the deeds are to do with real estate, with, with um, land, with um, houses, so that the, the name of the street, the name of the townland within which... The, the property is located, they're indexed in the town, ta the lands index. And the lands indexes are a bit more problematical because they're only roughly alphabetical at least until um, up to the 1830s, 1828. Um, that means that if you were looking for transactions covering a townland called Bally something or other, um, you're going to have to wade through the entire letter B um, in each volume of these indexes, again, they're subdivided into different periods, so that can be pretty um, arduous. Um, after 1828, they, they're more precisely subdivided, and you you can you can pick them pick them out more easily. But I mean, this, for example, is this is an example of a grantor's index, and you can see this is 1777 to 1785. It's purely alphabetical. You get the grantor's name. You get the, his forename or her forename. You get the surname of the grantee. You get the volume number. You get the page number. And you get the number of the memorial. Okay. The volume number is literally the number of the volume in which this memorial is located. So if you're in the Registry of Deeds, you have to go and get volume 366 out if you want to find out what James Kingston was doing with the, the Pike family or Mr. Pike. Um, within volume 366, it's then page 142, and the memorials are numbered sequentially, so this should be memorial number 244243. If you're looking at the deeds, if you're looking at the indexes, you need to copy each of these index entries. Um, Sometimes the, the, the memorial number might seem superfluous if you have the volume and the page number, but there are times when it's useful, when the volume and page aren't quite um, accurate, so the, the, the memorial number can be useful as well. Let's look at the, the lands index now. This is um, the lands index for Donegal. Um, you can see one of the problems about the lands index was that it was difficult to have a, a, a format that was repeated all the way through. So sometimes they had to shoehorn um, lots and lots of, of townlands into a small space, lots and lots of grantees or grantors into a, a, a small space. It becomes much less uh, usable. It's there, all the information is there. You have, this is slightly different from 1845, but you have the volume, the page number, and the memorial number in all cases. Okay, um, it would be good, it would be very good if there was a grantees index and um, there are some moves afoot to digitise the whole things completely, so that would be wonderful. Um, one of the points about, one of the problems about the registry is that the, um, the deeds themselves are very legalistic. Um, there are formulae involved that you, you can sort of discount so they all start like this. They all start a memorial of, and it's usually an indented deed of agreement dated something or other. You get the date, you get the names of the two parties, 
um, or three parties or four parties, the numbers of people involved in it. And very often, if you're scanning through, that's as, that's as far as you need to go. You need to know that these are not the people I'm interested in, and away you go. Um, one of the things about the fact that it's online, a lot of the time, it, it's if you think it might be uh, the person you're interested in, it's a very good idea to take a copy of it and take it away and stare at it for a long period and try and work out what exactly is happening. Okay? Um, there are various um, kinds of transaction. By far the most common are leases. Okay? That's where they can run for up to a thousand years um, or for the number of lives mentioned or for a mixture of the two. Um, they are the, by far the most common um, very often they're disguised uh, that they're involved in deeds of lease and release um, it was a legal device because it wasn't obligatory to record a transaction um, um, less than a year so you what you did was you leased it for a year and then you released it for the, the, the term you were really aiming at so they, again legal loopholes were being used but they're they're useful it, it's it's hit and miss whether they contain family information Marriage settlements are by far the most useful for um, for genealogy. They, what were marriage settlements? They were insurance um, policies for the brides, particularly. Women's property rights were so bad at this period that if a husband died, um, the husband's family could come in and just throw the throw the wife out on the street with nothing. She had no rights to the family home. She had no rights to any of the property, any even, even property that she had brought into the marriage via a dowry or that. They, it, it all rested with the husband. And if he died, um, she was in deep trouble. Unless there had been a marriage settlement, which very often um, involved the two families setting up a joint trust um, to produce an income for her in the event of the husband's um, predeceasing her. Okay, so... You can see because the both families are involved, it's very often brothers and sisters of the the bride and groom, um, aunts, uncles. Um, you get a very very good sense of the the extended families. Um, <clears throat> this, if you if you're a reader of Jane Austen, you know that that uh, marriage was as much about property as about love at this time. This is this is Jane Austen territory, and um, the the marriage settlements are the 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 um the gold they're the holy grail of, of research in the re genealogical research in the registry of deeds there are all sorts of other interesting bits and pieces in there mortgages deeds of trust wills um rent charges the wills have all been published and they're online at irishmanuscripts.ie and again only wills likely to be contested legally were registered but still given that we blew up all the the original wills um this is a there are three volumes of these transcripts they they are they they're abstracts they're not the complete documents but they will give you all the family information and the 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 gist of the property um involved and it'll give you the exact reference that you can then go and look at the original if you want okay um the the real joy of what's happened in the last few years is that it's no longer necessary to go into the registry of deeds and schlup up the stairs and climb up the ladders and take down these giant tombstones of books and, and breathe in 200 year old um, dust all of the the indexes and the memorial books right up to 1929 are now available online okay they're available on the the lds website familysearch.org let me show you where they are um, again the, the link is here on the site in the section dealing with um, uh, the registry of deeds um, in 1951 as you can see they went into the registry of deeds they started at one end of the the memorial room they microfilmed all the indexes all the lands index all the grantors indexes and all the memorial books right up to 1929 and those are all available online you can see here grantors index a 1708 to 1785 and so on that they, they uh they they mimic the 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 way using them you have to mimic the way you would use the indexes and the memorials um 
in person. You have to search the, the indexes, find a reference. Again, the grantor, grantee, volume, page, memorial number. Um, once you found that in the index, then you have to go to the, 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 the microfilm image of the volume containing that, download that, go through it and find the right page. Um, so it's quite a cumbersome process, but it is, um, you can do it from your front room, you can do it from Australia or North America, you don't have to be in the Registry of Deeds here in Dublin to do it. Um, what you're downloading when you click on these links here is, uh, the act, uh, is a digitized version of the microphone. So it's quite uh, big and it's quite cumbersome. Okay, let me just show you shortcuts. The Registry of Deeds Index Project Ireland, which is um, being carried out under the auspices of the Irish Genealogical Research Society, has a website, irishdeedsindex.net. And this predates the, the putting online of the, the Mormon microfilms. Um, they were working from physical copies of the microfilms in LDS um, family history libraries and transcribing, abstracting um, deeds. They've done a really good job of, let me just show you, um, let me just show you what it looks like. The Registry of Deeds Index project. Um, they have, uh, I see, main index. So you can search on memorial number, you can search on family name. Let's see, Hamilton and search. And you will get uh, a list of all the deeds that they've transcribed that include Hamilton's um, with links to the full transcript here. So Memorial 182 in 1789. Um, and you get a full, a full abstract. So they abstract all the family information and what's happening. It's quite schematic and quite abstract, but it's well worth um, persevering with. Um, it's the, the only digital version of the um, of the the indexes uh, of, of the memorials that there is online as well as doing that the transcription they've also since the the microfilms went online they've done a series of a wonderful series of shortcuts into them so if you know um, a memorial number you can simply enter the volume number and the image number and go directly to it okay um, if you know well which you should if you're looking searching the grantors index you have here so say your grantor is hamilton and you the deeds you're looking for are sometime in between 1770 and 1800 so index h h 1788 to 85 um, you get direct links to where the letter starts um, so h the first image the last image of h from 1708 to 1785 and they go on down they go on to the um the you can see that's 1785 to 93 94 to 99 and so on so uh, they give you uh, a route in to the um to the grantor index uh, so rather than um scrolling through the the entire list of um of all 2000 what is it um, 2,686 microfilms. This gives you, it's a very, very useful, um, very, very useful shortcut into it. There's also shortcuts to the lands index and there's a guide to navigating the family, family history, um, family search films online. Um, let me just give you finally a, a sense of what it's like to say, look at the grantor index from 1758 to 1776. Um, here and there we go okay you can see what you're looking at here is the uh, the complete microfilm just shoved through a digitizing machine and producing one image per one digital image per microfilm frame so if we pick at random this is Image 11 of 339, you can zoom in and you can see, remember we were talking about W, so Henrietta Wakeley and others to Everard and others, um, two good Anglo-Irish surnames there. 
volume 244, page 25, um, page 225, memorial 157580. Okay, with those, you can go directly to the, the volume containing the image, go to page 225, ensure that it's, it's um, memorial number 157580, and away you go um, with disentangling it and taking a screenshot of it is a, always a good idea so that you can go back and chew over it at your leisure. Um, I mentioned earlier as well that, that those particular, um, the memorial numbers, the way the, the transcriptions were done, the memorials came in, there were a number of transcribers, I'm not sure how many, maybe five, six, seven, working simultaneously, and they were all transcribing into, into their own volumes. So uh, you have volume 10, 11, 12, and 13, all going at the same time, with the memorials being transcribed into them. So, for example, Memorial 100 would be transcribed into Volume 10, Memorial 101 into Volume 11, 102 into Volume 12. So you have this simultaneous transcribing going on into multiple volumes. Sometimes the index entries are wrong. The volume number is wrong or the page number is wrong. And that's and if you check the volumes on either side of this volume it may be there it may be just that they were indexing them as they transcribed them and sometimes they got the volume numbers wrong so it's, it's worth keeping that in mind okay um, I'm going to, to stop there I think that's that's as much as most people as the human frame can bear about um, the Registry of Deeds um, it's as I said a very useful resource it's an extraordinary resource for um, the Anglo-Irish over the, the, the century or so between 1720 and 1830, um, given that so many Church of Ireland registers were destroyed, uh, given that so many wills were destroyed, it is a, a major resource for that particular group of people. I should also say as well that the, the Property Registration Authority of Ireland, which is now in charge of the Irish Registry of Deeds, is in the process of um, uh, developing a digitization program for the deeds um, a full digitization program uh, you can see from the microfilms we were looking at they're all black and white they're um, state of the art for 1951 but that's um, 70 years ago so we're talking about full um, full color scans and we're talking about um, very good machine read um, transcripts searchable transcripts of them so there's a very ambitious project um, on the way but it's not going to be here uh, this year or next year or the year after um, and in the meantime the, the family search uh, microfilm images are the way to go anyway I hope you find this useful um, and the very best of luck to you um, may the road rise before you